when they try to do a like a standing armbar, and mm-hmm. then they don't understand. In order to armbar someone and to break <laughs> the arm, you need a pivot where you can fix it. And if that thing does not move, then you can yeah. break it. Once yes. you both are standing and moving, where is this pivot? Or where can you make it stable where both of you are? It, and it's so funny. And it's like, when you're on the ground or in some positions, you can make it, you stabilize, then you can break. Otherwise, where is the point of stabilization to do that? And they don't even understand that. I mean, you do wrestling, Bill. You understand what I mean? How can you do that? But they think yeah. they could, right? And you know? I, here's the funny thing for me. I've been on both sides of this argument because 20 years ago, my Aikido bra- background made me think that I understood certain pressure testing. So I, I very much had that, that the idea that we're laughing at right now, I very much had the idea of like, oh, you know, there's the sport side of it, but we practice the real art. And uh, then Tim Hall came along, you know, a few years into my uh, me teaching this way. And made me realize, no, I don't understand at all. And that's, like I said, I taught Tim Hall swords. He taught me wrestling. And that was a major, major shift in how I understood things. And it's hard to tell a person who hasn't trained wrestling what they're missing. (laughs) You know, something which is very, you know, just I don't want to hijack this uh, from away from weapons, but something which is very interesting to talk. I remember it was like three years ago. And the guy came to me, a person said, I mean, I don't want to step on anyone's toes, but he, I mean, Bill, in order to wrestle, you need muscles. You need to be athletic as well, oh, yeah. right? But this person, I mean, come on, didn't have any muscles, right? He was, <laughs> cool. okay, but no problem, right? Yeah. But then he told me, <laughs> oh, I heard you do wrestling. I said, I do also BJJ and wrestling, both one. And he said, oh, okay, but um, so, what is your base? I say, yeah, I mean, I do wrestling in BJJ, wrestling Greco-Roman, but I do also freestyle. And he said, yeah, freestyle is not good. I said, why? He said, listen, listen, single leg and double leg takedown, okay? If someone wants to do it, the only thing you need to do in combat wrestling, which I do from a manuscript you learn, yeah. <laughs> listen, listen, he goes for your single and double leg takedown, okay? And you bring your <laughs> elbow up, you hit him on the back of his neck and you break his neck. And I looked at him and I said, um, excuse me, can I ask you a question? I said, well, two questions actually, yes. First of all, have you watched any UFC? <laughs> you know, just this whole sport. <laughs> and I said, have you seen the faces of professional fighters? And I'm, I, with all respect, because I'm going to interview two of them soon, but I mean, I'm sorry, you know, the face shows everything, the pressure they had, the, right? So yeah. You see the faces or the bodies? Do you think you can break the neck? Oh, I could. And this guy, you know, doesn't have any muscles, nothing. He's really so, well, I don't want to, okay, but it's stuff here, right? And I looked at him and I said, that's the first question. And then the second, a single leg, a double leg, they shoot like a bullet, like a pistol. Yeah. They, you know what he thought for single or double leg? They yeah. come to you, they go down, grab your leg. And I said, this is not the way it's done. I said, how? So I said, do you want me to do it with you? I said, yeah. So I just you know, made a shot and I went down which is for his leg and grabbed Iranian style, his ankle. I did ankle pick, brought him up. And okay, I have to admit, we have we had the weight difference as well. I'm not yeah. a tall guy, but I weigh a lot. And this guy <laughs> didn't weigh that much. So he just... <laughs> and he couldn't do his uh, elbow and he said this was so fast i said yeah that's the way single leg and double leg is now but i didn't tell him but even if i went the way he wanted me to go believe me his elbow wouldn't do anything yeah. to <laughs> i can guarantee you that but you know once you watch this and then you ask i ask always myself i ask myself how on earth do these people think professional fighters like UFC is just a sport and a game? What, what, what comes to your mind to even think about that? These are real fighters, you know? I mean, God, I just don't understand that, Bill. I don't understand that, but okay, maybe. So this was something which came to my mind and uh, 
well, you know, and uh, that's why, you know, I also, you know, saw, of course, talk to Tim and also your school. And uh, I also told my guys, oh, these guys wrestle very well. They, these guys know what grappling and wrestling means in your school, which is very nice uh, to see, right? That more Himo schools uh, do that. I just mm -hmm. saw, Bill, that there are also uh, competitions. Okay, before we change, do you, what do you think about Hema competitions? What do you think about that point? Oh, I, I very much enjoy them. Um, so there's always pros and cons to competitions, but generally speaking, as long as you accept them for what they are, which is they are a game to give you inspiration to train harder, to work harder, to push yourself in a competitive environment. Um, you know, the rules don't matter. Uh, like people complain all the time, like, oh, that rule's not real or something. It doesn't matter if it's real. <laughs> Uh, no, it does. It's a game. I fully yeah. agree with you. Yeah. It's Rugby teaches people to be tougher. It doesn't matter that it's not a combat sport. It teaches people to be tougher. It teaches people to be faster. Um, people who do rugby tend to do martial arts incredibly well. Um, yes. And likewise, just training competitive mindset of being under pressure, of saying there's 10 seconds on the clock. I'm down by a point. I got to push myself. Um just that learning that kind of fire in you for to be able to compete is martial. So uh, I find tournaments to be a fantastic trainer uh, for for motivating you to be able to to understand combat much much better. Yes, absolutely. And now Hema they have also the wrestling discipline, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I remember that, right? Mm -hmm. They have this as well. They yeah. Have. So. Uh, the wrestling still has a long way to catch up to the rest of uh, the HEMA arts. So wrestling tournaments are not as common, but they, they've become more common over the years. And what tends to happen is you have a HEMA wrestling tournament and all the guys who did judo win, right? <laughs> um, because yeah, it just... Doesn't make sense. You know, You're right. No, as, as, yeah, as important as the treatises and the manuscripts are for us to understand how they originally did it like we were just talking about if you don't have extensive experience especially in competitive type of grappling then the people who do tend to win and so right now hema ring in tournaments tend to look like judo um they tend to be judo with a different type of outfit on uh just because of that reason uh tim hall in particular has actually made a push for certain styles of rules to kind of promote the things that we tend to see in the treatises a little bit more. And I think that's wonderful. Uh, but like I said, I, I feel like um, the, the ring in aspect tends to be something that uh, we're still catching up on. So. Okay. No, of course, I fully agree with you. It doesn't make <laughs> sense that you, you know, people from judo, wrestling or grappling arts come and they just win everything. Right. No. <laughs> Yeah, it then shows that the rules are in the favor of the game they have been practicing for years. Right? Yes. But as you already mentioned that as well, you know, it's just like, you know, these are all games, which are tough games, which we need to practice, but these are games which teach us to uh, fight under, you know, in resistance, that someone resists you and you fight. I fully agree. But they're, at the end of the day, uh, they there are games. You know, for example, you know, it's so interesting that... Um, as uh, you might know, for example, when I passed my, I'm preparing for my third time in Kyukushin Black Belt, mm -hmm. but then when I was, uh, uh, then they told me, okay, now you fight against Shihan Nazari, who is like two meters, uh, 15 and 145 kilo muscle mass, one of the toughest guys. And then I was fighting, but then it's okay, I'm ready to get to fight. And he said, no, 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 we are playing the game. So then I realized in Kyukushin circles, which I forgot, I have to say that, they call it a game. They don't mm -hmm. call it fighting. And then I said, because, and then I distanced myself for you because I had first Dan Black Belt and I came to the, the two and a half years ago, second Dan, I'm preparing for third. And I said to Shihan Nazari, why did you change the name from fighting to game? He said, no, we are, we are sick and tired of all this fighting, fighting. We are playing, it's a game. Mm -hmm. It's a full contact game, like a rugby player, like, a, like we do like rugby player, like this. And then the same thing, Iranian wrestlers, they call it the game. So it's like you're playing tennis. Then I said, why? He said, listen, the difference is this. As tough as Kyukushin is bare knuckle, you knock the guy out, right? It's a knockout, as we know. But mm -hmm. you know, the moment you call it a fight, ego comes in play. 
That's a very good thing. We play a game like tennis. If you lose tennis game, you lost the game. If you lose a fight, you lost your honor. <laughs> That's what he told me. <laughs> and I said to Shihan Nazari, you are right. Do you see, Bill, what he was trying to say? I said, we <laughs> want people to understand this is not a self-defense situation. If you come and win or lose, this is in the game which prepared you to become a better fighter, but it's not a fight, a life and death situation. Or, and there's he, here we are talking about a full contact fight, right? But still, and I think this mindset is very interesting to observe for us. Do I get, you know, upset if I lose a tennis match? Right, not, right? <laughs> oh, then I lost a tennis match or badminton <laughs> or whatever. I think this was a very, for me at least, it was very real eye-opening experience mm -hmm. to have such a talk that they say we are going to do that so our people do not get their ego involved so much into this type of training. So this was very mm -hmm. interesting for me to, to watch that. Um, and uh, what about dagger fight? You just mentioned dagger. What kind of oh, dagger yeah, sure. do you like? Is it like uh, medieval style like uh, this I or forward grip? Uh, it does both grips. Um, so the medieval style dagger, ten, at least the, in the treatises we have, has a lot of um, connection directly to armored combat. So even if it's taught to fight out of armor, there's still a, a lot of overlap of it's, it's a holistic art where armor is part of it. Um, so you, you end up using both grips depending on what you, you need to accomplish at the time. It is a lot more wrestling uh, focus than, uh, than modern knife fighting. So a major reason for that is because if I am fighting in armor for an opponent, so we've gone for our daggers, the slashing is worthless in, in armor. <laughs> so we're trying to go into the gaps and the more ice pick reverse grip uh, that tends tends to be a little bit more favored when you're wearing armor. Um, but you definitely use both grips all the time. And there's a lot more wrestling involved with it, right? My opponent goes in to attack me. Um, I might block them and I go to attack them and I don't hit anything. So instead of me just blocking and stabbing, I need to secure the arm. I need to put them into some position where I get dominance. Then I will work upon finding an opening in a minute. But uh, it's more important I stop their, their dagger arm than it is that I hit them right away. So there's, uh, there's a lot more of the, the wrestling components in it um, compared to just various different knife arts that we see in modern times. What is this dagger called again? You hold like that in medieval times? The one that's most most commonly talked about in modern times is the rondel dagger. Oh, rondel. The rondel meaning round so or, or a circular disc. So most of those daggers tend to have the, the two circular discs for the, the pommel and the... Um, the, the guard and then there's the grip and then you have the blade sticking out of it but that isn't the only kind that just happens to be the one that tends to be uh, most popularly depicted okay and then uh, let's just before we finish our talk today are you also or do you teach also more exotic weapons like maces or axes or things like that so um the most exotic one that I teach would be the, the grain sickle, which uh, there's a 16th century German treatise that has a thing on farmer's weapons. So it has the grain sickle, uh, the scythe, and the, um, the uh, threshing flail. Uh, so those ones would be the most exotic that I do. But um, a lot of the weapons that were used, unfortunately, we don't have treatises for. So the mace we can take a lot of educated guesses on how it was used. Uh, I've definitely experimented a lot. And if you understand how a single hand sword works, then, you know, if you just make some modifications, you can take a guess on how a, a mace probably was used, but it's still a guess just because for whatever reason, we don't have any treatises on that or a single handed ax, um, for example, it's, it's not hard to go, oh, okay, this is probably how they used it, but it's still, you know, like any history, you have to be honest with yourself that you're, you're making some things up. Uh, so Greg Mele, um, he always used uh, the term frog DNA for us recreating this arts, where like in Jurassic Park, in order to recreate the dinosaur, 
they had to take frog DNA to, to make that dinosaur. And he is always bringing up, well, how much, how much are we importing from what we think they were doing? How much from modern martial arts or just our own biases are we putting in there? And which case, how much of a dinosaur are we resurrecting or how much of a frog are we re resurrecting? And I've always thought that was a great analogy because for, yeah, for the earlier arts, there is a lot of that frog DNA that we have to put in. There's a lot that we are guessing and that we are making our own assumptions on that are like, well, it probably was done this way. And weapons like the mace and at least the single-handed axe, we, we, we're, we're guessing for a lot of it. We're, we're hopefully making educated guesses, but we are guessing. <laughs> Absolutely. But we need also, as you mentioned, that there are only certain ways human body functions. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right. That's why we see so many similarities between arts which have been, which have survived, right? Mm -hmm. There are martial arts which have survived um, over a long period of time, but you see yes. also similarities between them, right? Yeah. So, or look <laughs> at the wrestling arts, right? I mean, look at, I mean, lots of these wrestlings, you know, they've survived for centuries you know they're yes. practicing them or traditional ones you see the similarities are striking i mean also places which have been isolated like the amazon where they do these mm -hmm. uh, traditional wrestling or africa Absolutely. or you go to persia iran you go to europe and you just say god how similar they see because you know at the end of the day we should not also forget that there are certain ways human body moves but i fully agree with you I, what you said is completely true, but the other way around is also true that, you know. <laughs> yeah. And something I always point out to people that we sometimes don't think about, there's sometimes a difference in cultural aesthetic. Uh, you know, yeah. the way an Italian walks and moves is different than how an American walks and moves. And so there's certain things that we just, our culture shapes what we find pleasing to see, and that sometimes seeps into the martial arts. Um, yeah. But that's superficial, right? It's if you look at what the core action is, like you said, there's only so many different ways the human body moves, but one culture might do it in a subtly different way because that's just the way their culture appreciates movements or that's just how they grew up moving. So uh, that's one of those things when I look back on historical martial arts that I always wonder, are do we look like what they looked like? Uh, they, because there's a high chance that, you know, I wear... I wear clothes that stretch, right? A medieval person didn't. They had to wear a completely different type of um, seam because their clothing didn't stretch the same way. So that affects how I might reach for something. Even though the way I might you know, do an arm drag is probably in theory the same, they might've done it very, very subtly different just because of the way their clothing was. Um, and functionally it's the same thing, but it might've looked a little bit different. Good point. Yes, very good. Absolutely. I remember a couple of years ago, there was a, like a match between, I mean, there are, I mean, close to Africa, Canary Islands in Spain, mm -hmm. that belong to Spain, and they have this uh, Lucha Can, uh, you know, this Lucha Canaria, so they have this uh, wrestling, traditional wrestling from there, and then there was, I forgot the name, Korean traditional wrestling from Korea. They're also very strong guys, so they oh, came. Yeah, I can't remember the term. <laughs> you know, and then these, you know, I mean, I, I travel to Canadian islands a lot. I have friends there, and these guys are so strong. God, they are so strong. They really look like bulls. I mean, have you seen a bull? These are these guys. And then, you know, all, you know, I mean, they say, do you have weight class here, guys? No, we just wrestle. Oh, okay. You know, it's like sumo, right? <laughs> So it's a really interesting. I mean, they introduced some actually, but traditionally they don't, right? So then yeah. these giants came, and then these Koreans, I remember, they were wrestling, right? Lucha Canaria against them. And lots of, you know, a bit of nationalism is there, Koreans against these guys, but very nice. Wrestlers are very nice to each other. But mm -hmm. then I remember when some of them, were, you know, the Spanish won or the Koreans won. And then one of the Spanish, I and mean, I don't speak Korean, so I couldn't communicate with them. Most of them didn't speak English, but I speak Spanish. So then Spanish guys told me, some of these wrestlers, I'm not sure, these guys stole some of our techniques. I said, why, why do you say they stole it? Because they just do the same we do. And they say, you know, like this, you know, this arm throw. And I said, why do you assume they stole it from Lucha Canaria, right? Why do you say that? I said, I can tell you from Iranian wrestling, which has been for thousands of years, we do the same. 
<laughs> what do you mean is they stole it from you? Oh, they just, you know, this is not Korean. And it was so funny to watch it. Yeah, but they are so similar. I said, yeah, they're, you know, it's very interesting. But I remember that. It was beautiful to watch these, uh, you know, different wrestling, traditional wrestling arts compete against each other. Really beautiful art. <laughs> but I remember that. They stole our technique. I said, they, I mean, what is this, right? It's not like high-end technology they stole it from you, right? <laughs> Just an art throw, right? <laughs> so this was, but your point is really correct. I mean, it really makes a difference. So, you know, for example, I, I love judo. I love really judo. But let's look at this. And we have a traditional wrestling art in Iran, which, which I wrote an academic article on that, which is mm -hmm. chukhe. It comes from 12th century, actually. The latest, rec you know, it's recorded 12th century. And they have like a jacket, like judo, and they have such throws. The only difference is that they can also go for single and double leg takedown. That's mm -hmm. what they can do. And uh, so they do that. And then, and then I remember when I talked to them and then they said, they told me these throws we do, and they're very successful in judo, very successful. They come in, many national uh, judo players of Iran are, come from Po Chuche. But then I told them, why don't you go to freestyle or Greco-Roman? They looked at me, no, we don't have a chance. And I said, what, we are used to grab this jacket, that game, you can't grab nothing. Most of our throws don't work in that area. See, and I really loved how honest they were, right? Mm -hmm. And other way around, other way around is true as well. Many yeah. wrestlers, Olympic wrestlers told me they cannot come and compete against Pachuche or Judo because they just grab them and they cannot do all these wrestling moves. You know? <laughs> because they're, they don't, they don't, can, cannot move, right? The way they do in <laughs> wrestling. So, Again, it's again uh, it, it says exactly what you mentioned there. Even in modern um, um, you know, time, the, the, what you are wearing changes your wrestling game. I fully agree. And actually, um, historically, there is a treatise written by a, a man who was named uh, Pietro Monte in the 16th century. And he talks about things like that. So he, he talks about, for example, he says, um, Oh, the, the Germans, when they wrestle, they, they like to roll on the ground, you know, and, and such a, you know, like, like they're pigs, whereas the Italians, when they wrestle, and he, he would say these things talking about the, the different countries, how some people had certain cultural reasons why they did it, and he, he dismisses some or says others are good, um, but he even makes a point of saying uh, that some people wrestle without clothing and some people do. And he says that if you want to train to be a soldier, if you want to learn how to fight in armor, you need to wrestle with your doublet on because you need to get used to people grabbing it. And he said that in armor, that's going to happen. People will grab all sorts of things and you can't look to see it. You need to feel it. Um, so historically, that was an issue too. <laughs> yes, very good point. I agree with you. Well, well, very good point. Thank you very much. And uh, at the end of our uh, talk, it was very good. And thank you for your insights into this and uh, HEMA and weapons. It was beautiful. Bill, do you, would you like, oh, by the way, Bill, before I forget, tell us a bit what you do also on the side. You make beautiful oh. scabbers. Tell us about this, please, a bit. Before so I ever since, yeah, ever since the pandemic happened, um, <laughs> I suddenly was, you know, I had to, um, our fencing school had to close down for the, the pandemic. It still hasn't been able to reopen anyway. Um, and on top of that, I, as I mentioned, I had to retire from it. But uh, on the side, I started picking up all sorts of uh, crafts that were hobbies that um, since I wasn't working, it suddenly turned into my job. So I, um, I make a lot of historically inspired uh, objects, whether that's boxes or uh, you know leatherwork or woodwork. And um, a major part of that has become scabbard making because it's, you know, I, I've always had a love of swords. So I've really dived into to making scabbards and uh, in a lot of cases, decorating them with a lot of historically inspired um, artwork and historically inspired techniques. So I uh, started a, a business called historicalhandcrafts.com and uh, that's what I've been doing pretty much the entire pandemic. It's also how I've been paying my bills. It's been uh, uh, making objects that I've been selling. So. <laughs> we are going to put it, put the link here so our viewers who watch this, uh, if they want, they can contact you and then you know, order things from you. Just before, um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Before I forget, Bill, could you just, uh, in European context or scabbards, 
uh, scabbards were made of wood and covered with leather. Am I correct? Outside that, of that's the... by far the most common way for for swords. Okay. Um, with smaller objects, sometimes it was just leather. Just leather. And then, you know, do we have or did we have scabbards where inside the wooden frame they put felt inside? Uh, yes. Yeah, so there's some that would have wool or sometimes it would be, um, I believe actually felt was sometimes used or sometimes, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember, I feel like a lot of migration era ones, and I could be wrong about that, uh, had... Uh, I want to say it was rabbit uh, pelts, but I'm not exactly sure. And those why, would be why did they do that? That's my question. Why did they do that to keep the blade oiled? Oiled. Oh, that's great. Right. Um, and uh, so it would be the natural oils that were in the the fur. That uh, in addition to that, also when you oiled the weapon and you put it in there, that uh, I would trap. Now I I don't think that was that widespread. I know that in some cultures they did it more than in others. Um, I, I don't, I couldn't tell you why other cultures never did it. My, my best wild speculative guess is that uh, if you, the point of your sword got caught in it and you shoved it in, you probably ruined your scabbard. But other than that, that's my wild guess on why that wasn't necessarily that widespread. Um, a lot of them had wool as the lining, but plenty of them had no lining at all. So, Could you make such scabbards as well? Oh yes, it's it's actually not that hard to do. Uh, oh, you just have to when you're when you're first assembling the scabbard, you would uh, you would put it in before it was all wrapped up in the leather and so on. Okay, because I, because one of our guys asked me where he could have such a scabbard made. I said I don't oh. know. I'm not a maker. I mean, that's the reason I ask you. So you can make that as well. Okay, very good, very good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you very much, Bill. And it was lovely, really, having you here on this channel. And yeah, hopefully, hopefully we can invite you back so you can show us one day, if you wish, some techniques of uh, of a long sword or rapier or whatever you wish in future, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much. Have a nice day, Bill. Oh, you, you too. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>